I think it's working. Perfect. <laughs> I will. I don't know if it's right or not. That's a whole other question. Being recorded. Okay. Anybody know how I get this bigger? How about up here? Let's just in. It just goes up and down. Huh? Thank you. That doesn't do it. A few more. Six o'clock. You're very prompt. That's good. So we'll uh, we'll do this for oh, we'll get some more. Got to right. Now this will be uh, this will be recorded and it'll be up on our um, website under Christ Online. That has a list of all the different classes, and um, so you know every every Wednesday you can be here in person, or if a Wednesday you can't make it, you can watch it Zoom it live, or at any time you can do the uh, the recording too. So everybody can hear us okay online. Yep. There is a thumbs up. Good deal. All right, let's give it another minute or two. Hey, Kyle. What's up, Mr. Scott? All right, good to see you. Good to see you too. Good. We'll get a few more that might show up. I've got a handout there. This is the test. If you uh, <laughs> want to start filling it out, you can. Actually, we'll fill it out together. Fill it out together. All right, well, let's get started. I don't know who else, but we'll just kind of keep it open, okay? Oh, I see somebody else coming in here. We'll see if we are, uh, if we're the takers here, yep. All right, come on in. <laughs> All right, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good. We give you thanks for your word. It's a living word that continues to speak to us today be able to um, transform our hearts, guide our steps, and draw us closer to one another and to you. Bless this time together, O oh Lord, for we gather in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this, uh, this class is really for my kids, and you get to listen in. Because um, I was talking to Hannah and Nathan, who went through what most of you went through here, and maybe your other churches, baptized into a church, did the first communion, a confirmation, quill, and then you get into your 20s and 30s. Maybe you took a little hiatus for a couple of years during those college years, and then now you're out of uh, college and in the workplace, and now, now faith is maybe meaning something new to you, and you want to kind of get into it more. Your Baptist friends are running circles around you with their Bible quotes, and you're feeling woefully inadequate to be able to hold your own. So as I was talking to Hannah and Nathan about their Sunday school experience, talking about things in the Bible, and they said, Dad, 
we just got together and talked about our highs, lows, and God moments. It really wasn't strong biblical content. And then uh, they went to um, they went to college, and of course, college like you, like you guys, um, it just trains your mind to to um, to learn more and to go deeper more than just high, low, and God moments. You want some red meat. You want to know what's, uh, what's in scripture. And so there's a nice circling back now. Got another one. A nice circling back now to, um, to get into, into the word here. So um, what we're going to do is that we're going to go through the gospel of John. Because I love the gospel of John. But you just can't jump into it right away because they're going to be referring to some Old Testament things and some people and some themes that you need to know a little bit about before we um, just jump into it as it is. So you got the test on the paper there on the table. Hey, Lucy, thanks for joining us. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to pull up I'm going to pull up, oh, what is it here? Do I have 30? And we're going to go through it together. Share screen. All right, everybody can see that online as well. So let's go through this together and we can, we can fill it out. Now, See, it depends on what side of the spectrum you are on in terms of how you read scripture. There are certainly those who read it very literally, very fundamentalistly, very, very narrowly in my mind. And there are those who have a more progressive understanding of it. For instance, if you ask, when did these events happen? You'll get a different response. You know, you go to some of these Bible bookstores and they have this timeline of the Bible, all right? And in the timeline of the Bible, it talks about when creation is, and no lie, is September 26, 4004 BC. That's according to a very conservative understanding. Now, I've got ties older than that, so I know that can't be true, but in that very conservative understanding is 4004 BC. Now, we, I, don't go along with that. But in terms of the first event in, in the scriptures. But let me move this thing over. I can move from here, don't I? I got two computers working here. <laughs> right over there. Good. All right. But really, what we're talking here, Genesis 1 through 11, we call prehistory. We call it prehistory because we really don't have any accurate dating of those things in that prehistory period, which includes creation, Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel. We really don't know when those things happened. The first thing that we can date with any kind of certainty about is Abraham. And Abraham, again, is right around 1800 BC. Now the Egyptian empire begins about 3100 BC. It is still, of course, in effect, way into the whole Old Testament biblical times. But Abraham is about the first one that we can really date with any certainty, Genesis 12. And of course, Abraham is the father of three great world religions, Christianity, what else? Judaism and Islam. They all go back to Abraham as the father. The name Abram in Hebrew means father. The name Abraham means father of a great nation which was a cruel and unusual joke on this man. Because at 75 years old, God comes to him and says that you're going to be blessed with a lot of descendants, a lot of land, and a lot of blessings. 
at 75 years old. And how long did it take for him to have the child of the blessing? 25 years. 25 years. A long time, huh? Up until that time, he was childless, and he had to walk around with the name father of a great nation. But Abraham, of course, is married to who? Sarah. Sarah. And Sarah's name means what? Was there any Sarah's here? <laughs> you would think mother of a great nation. No. <laughs> All right. Sarah means princess. So Abraham is married to Sarah. And, uh, but Abraham has his first child. And the first child's name is? Ishmael. 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 And the mother of Ishmael is? Hagar, because it gets to be about, I don't know, 15 years into this promise, and they're still childless. And so Sarah says, take my servant woman, Hagar, as a surrogate wife, and you can have a child through her, which apparently was standard acceptable practices back then. I guess they assumed that Sarah was the problem and not Abraham. <laughs> so Abraham and Hagar have their child named Ishmael. And Ishmael means what? God hears. Whenever you see E-L at the end of a name or in the end of a place, E-L means God. In Hebrew, God. Ish means to hear. He's called Ishmael because Sarah gets jealous of Hagar and the golden child that she kicks them out of the camp. They go off into the wilderness, surely to die. But God hears the cries of Ishmael and Hagar, rescues them. And Ishmael then becomes the father of the Islamic nation. That's how it goes all the way back to Abraham, all three of them. Ishmael. But there is a child who does come. The second child is named Isaac. Isaac, and that's to Sarah. Isaac, we have an Isaac here. We don't. Isaac name is means what? Uh, he laughs. He laughs because when when um, Sarah was ninety years old and Abraham was one hundred years old, three visitors come by the camp. They stay for dinner and they say, when we come back in one year, Sarah will have a baby. Again, she's 90, he's 100. And what does Sarah do? She laughed, she laughed. And here's the poetic justice. Every time, every time Sarah calls her son out to come home for dinner, he laughs, he laughs, come for dinner. She is reminded one more time that she laughed at God's promise. So after 25 years, 25 years, they finally have the child of the promise, Isaac. And then it gets to be time for Isaac, for Isaac to have a wife. And they go out to their kinfolk because that's the way they do it. And they find a beautiful woman whose name is Rebecca. 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 And Rebecca, and Rebecca and Isaac, they have twins, and their name here? Jacob and, Jacob and Esau. Good. Jacob and Esau. Esau means literally the hairy one. Jacob, any Jacobs in here? Jacob means, well, the polite way is the supplanter. The vernacular is the cheater, Jacob, because he cheats his brother out of his birthright. Esau should have received all, all the benefits of being the firstborn. But of course, he comes in after hunting one day. He is famished. And Jacob says, I will give you this portage if you sell me or give me your birthright. And he said, deal, I'm about to die. 
And of course, then when Isaac is near death, he mistakenly blesses Jacob and not Esau. So really the line, and once you do a blessing, a blessing is not just putting his hands on his son and say, good luck. Good luck with all of this. It is actually a transferable power, authority. So Jacob indeed has this. So it goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And then it's time for Jacob to have a wife. And he goes back to his kinfolk, goes back to his uncle. His uncle's name is? Israel. No. <laughs> Laban. Laban. I don't know what Laban means. <laughs> he sees the beautiful Rachel. Beautiful Rachel. The name that means the she lamb. The she lamb. And he says, how much for your daughter? <laughs> and he said, oh, you can have my daughter. You got to work how many years? It's always seven. Always seven is the number. Seven years. And Jacob says, deal. And so seven years, seven years, he works for Laban. Goes into the wedding tent. And at this time, the wedding celebration is like a week long. Probably with a lot of wine. He goes into the wedding tent. And he wakes up the next morning, not next to Rachel, the she lamb. But next to who? Leah. Or Leah, Leah. L-E-H, L-E-A-H. Leah means the heifer. So he wakes up to one that's not nearly as pretty as, as Rachel. And with a shriek, he jumps out, finds Laban, and says, what's up? He says, well, in our country, we marry off the oldest one first. But if you want Rachel... All you have to do is work an additional seven years and you can have her deal. Now, how many children does Jacob have? It's a little bit of a trick question. Because from Jacob, there are 13 children. And the reason it's a trick question is because most people only count 12. Because these are the 12 sons. Because these are the 12 tribes of Israel. But there's also a daughter, Dinah. So they have 13 children, not between just Rachel and Leah, but each one of them have a handmaiden as well. There are four women. And from the four women, got 13 kids. Now, can you name some of the 12 tribes of Israel, some of the 12 sons of Jacob? Judah. Judah. Benjamin. Benjamin. Joseph. Dan. Got kind of a short name. Dan. <laughs> Naphtali, Levi, Reuben. Love his sandwiches. Reuben. There's 12 of them. Now they're living, you know, together with Laban, but now they've got too big a family. They've got to go home. And, uh, you know, the trickster tricks Laban and steals the best sheep. Anyway, that's just his name. But he gets out there. They're bringing them all back to, back to a Palestine, Israel area. And, and Jacob and all of his family get out there. And one night, one night, they come across a river. And Jacob has to go back and forth and back and forth. So he brings a load over the river, comes back, gets some more, comes back, gets some more. He gets everybody on one side of the river, goes back for one more. He just has a couple of suitcases left. And he says, it's late. So he goes to sleep on that side of the river. And that night, what happens? Maybe remember? This thing. He wrestles with something. He wrestles with something. Something wrestles with him all night long, but can't seem to beat him. 
And then the sun starts coming up and this something says, ah, the sun, almost like a vampire. Ah, the sun, I've got to stop, I got to go. But Jacob's got a hold of him and says, you got to bless me first. You got to bless me first. At that point, this thing blesses him and says, no longer will you be called Jacob, which means the cheater. You will now be called Israel. And Israel, what do we have at the end of Israel? E-L, which means God. Israel literally means one who struggles with God. Because he was wrestling with this thing all night long on the riverbank. So now you can't have, you know, the patriarch of the whole Jewish nation be called the cheater. So now he is called Israel. So whenever you see Israel or Jacob in the Bible, it's really the same person. Really the same person. All right. So Jacob is renamed Israel. Jacob is married to, remember? Leah yeah. and Rachel. They have 13 children. Joseph is one of them. And Joseph is an arrogant, self-centered 17-year-old who stands before his brothers and says, I had a great dream last night that all of you bowed down to me. Isn't that a great dream? <laughs> they didn't think so. And then, of course, he was wearing that coat of many colors because he was really dad's favorite. And, of course, they sell him into slavery, which is the same as killing a person. Because how long do you suppose is the life expectancy of a person in slavery in Egypt? It's not long. But here's where the hand of God is at work. Because he doesn't go making adobe bricks for a pyramid for the next pharaoh. He works for a high official in the Egyptian government named Potiphar. Potiphar, yes. And Potiphar has, has a wife who has low scruples, and she seduces him. But Joseph, being, of course, a man of great integrity, refuses. And as, who said it? Hell hath no fury than a woman scorned. Who said that? That's a quote. Is that Shakespeare? Hell hath no fury. Somebody's got a phone nearby, don't you? Hell hath no fury than a woman scorned. She was scorned. And of course, they throw him into prison because of rape. And eventually, through knowing somebody and translating dreams, he gets to meet the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh's got a strange dream. I've got seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. What does it mean? Of course, it means five, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And Joseph said, let's store, let's store food. And everybody has to come over. Everybody has to come over, not just in Egypt, but all the surrounding countries to get food to survive during the famine, including his brothers. Now, you're Joseph. You're second in command of Egypt. You are. You have all the power in the world. And your brothers come. The ones who sold you into slavery. What could you do to them? You could throw them in jail. You could turn them into slaves. You could watch as they pull out their fingernails one at a time. I mean, you could do anything to these guys. Just say the word. But he doesn't. And in the end... They are, of course, very apologetic. But in Genesis 50, Joseph says to them, what you did, you meant for evil. Period. What you did, you meant for evil. But God meant it for good. So that I could be in this position and save many people. Here's where the hand of God is working in all these minute details. Bringing about bringing about God's ultimate will. Now we have to be very careful when we kind of dissect that. 
Does that mean that every bad thing that happens is according to God's will? No. Child that runs out into the street is hit by a car? No. The young mom with cancer that dies too young, leaving children? No. What it means is that God can take the worst of what life gives, the worst of the human heart, selling your brother into slavery. God can take the worst of it, take those broken pieces and put together a new mosaic and make all things new. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, that he may save many people. So now they're in Egypt. They're in slavery for Egypt for how many years? <laughs> About 400, 450 years. Again, it's approximate dates. We went over to Egypt on a uh, church trip a couple of years ago, and they're not even really sure what Pharaoh was during this time. You know, it's a huge, huge thing in Jewish history. I mean, the Exodus, you talk to your Jewish friends, you go to a Jewish worship service. The Exodus is a huge, huge thing. I don't think it was a big thing for the Egyptians. I don't, you know, we talk about the 10 plagues. I, it never made it in their history books. It never, they never really talked about it. So when you look at these mummies of these Egyptian pharaohs, they think this is the one, which is kind of cool because you're looking at the face of the person that met Moses. But we're really not sure the exact time, but 450 years in captivity, 450 years. So how long do you pray for something? You really, really praying for something? You really, you give it a full day of prayer? Good for you. Do you commit a whole week to a prayer of a month? 25 years like Abraham? 450 years in slavery in Egypt. Until finally Moses comes. And Moses' name means what? To draw out. To draw out. It has two meanings. What's the first meaning? Draw out. Where was he first drawn out? The Nile River, right. When they were killing all the Hebrew boys, mom throws them in the water in a basket and the Pharaoh's daughter finds him, brings him home and says, really, really, mom, I found it. And she believed him, her. He was drawn out of the water. And the second draw out, he drew the people out of Egypt through the Exodus into the promised land. How many years was the Exodus? I said seven was usually the answer. 40. It's either seven or 40. That's the answer. Seven or 40. So he leaves about 1350-ish BC. It takes 40 years. He gets all the way, all the way to the promised land with a bunch of grumbling, stiff-necked, ungrateful people who are complaining the whole way. He gets right to the promised land and God says, no way, Moshe, You're, you can't go in. And why didn't God let Moses go in to the promised land? It seems to me it's a small infraction. At the very end of the Exodus, Moses has it up to here with these people. They're worshiping golden calves. They're grumbling the whole way. By the way, do you know why it took 40 years? 40 years? Because it's not that far of a walk. 40 years. It's because God had to let that first generation that were grumbling and complaining to die off. That their children would inherit the promised land. There were only two of the original ones that got into the promised land. Joshua 
and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. And we'll get to them in a second. But Moses gets up to the promised land. And God says no because of the infraction. The infraction at the end, God said they need, they need water. The people were grumbling for water. And God told Moses, speak to this rock and tell it to bring forth water. And what did Moses do? Struck it with his, with his cane. And God said, because you did not trust me and just use your voice, you will not enter into the promised land. It seems like a mild infraction, doesn't it? But there's a great story at the end of Deuteronomy in which they're right at the brink. In fact, he brings them up to Mount Nebo, not over by Lake James, different Mount Nebo. Brings them up to Mount Nebo and shows them it. And then the end of Deuteronomy says, he goes off into the mist and no one knows where the grave of Moses is. The understanding that God would not let this one taste death. That he swooped him up, bypassed death, that ancient enemy, and brought him into heaven. Into Deuteronomy. With Moses gone, the new guy that takes over is Joshua. Now there's only two that make it in, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb means the righteous one. Joshua means God saves or God is salvation. Joshua is a Hebrew word, Hebrew name. You change Joshua into a Greek name, it becomes what? What's the answer always in Sunday school? Jesus. <laughs> it's the same name. Jesus and Joshua, a very common name back then. All right, takes over over here. So now they enter into the promised land, but they have no government. They got 10 commandments, they have no government. So here's, here's a word for the final exam. <laughs> a fictinami. I'm not even sure how to spell it. A fictinami. It is a form of government in which these tribes, these 12 tribes remained independent going into the promised land. But then when there was an enemy that came and threatened them like the Philistines, then these 12 tribes would, would gather around a single person that they would call a judge, a military leader. And then after the threat is gone, then they would go back to their individual 12 tribes, a fictinami. So can you name some of the, some of the judges? You can if you've heard them. I mean, you, you know them. Othniel. You might not know Othniel. <laughs> Sam, Samson. You knew Samson. Gideon. You love his Bibles in the hotel rooms. Gideon, Deborah, the last, the last one, his name is Samuel. And by the time Samuel comes, all the people clamor around him and they said, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. But Sam, Samuel said, you don't want a king. You got a king. God is your king. Besides, if you get a king, he's going he's gonna to tax you. He's going to take all your young men and put them into military service. And we're going to be a constant war with everybody else. You don't want a king, but the people clamored all the more. We want a king. And so finally, they succumbed. The first king of Israel's name is Saul who is later known as Paul. No, that's a different Saul, different Saul, Saul. Now, every one of these kings has a claim to fame and has a black mark. 
Saul's claim to fame, anybody have an idea? He was a head taller than anybody else. He was the biggest, baddest warrior in the, all of Israel. So he was the biggest guy, and he became perfect as they were coming together and staving off any other fights. His, his downfall? Jealousy. Jealousy over King David. When King David was just David, he used to sing a song. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And because of that jealousy, eventually he died in battle. Second king of Israel. His name is? David. Right around 1,000. That's just a good number to remember. 1,000 BC is David. This is the time... Well, not quite. David's claim to fame, it is a great line. It should be on all of our tombstones. A man after God's own heart. God said, this is a man after my own heart. That'd be a great testament to your life. A man, a woman after God's own heart. Faithfulness. His downfall? Adultery. With a beautiful woman next door from the palace called Bathsheba. Bathsheba. David supposedly wrote most of the Psalms. And one of the Psalms that he wrote, according to tradition, after he was discovered, is Psalm 51. Remember his discovery? You know, he sees this beautiful woman next door and uh, she tells his servants to go and catch her for him while all the men are out in battle. And when the king summoned you to the palace, it's not really an invitation. When she ends up pregnant, of course, he brings her husband from the front line figuring that he would enjoy the comfort of his home while he's on R&R, &R, and he doesn't. He says, I can't go into my, my home there while my buddies are out. I'll just sleep outside. That didn't work. So then he sends Uriah, the husband, to the front line. He's killed immediately. And then David stands before all of Israel and says, one of my best soldiers his dad, his wife is pregnant. I, I'll take her as one of my wives. Yes, I'll do that because I want to honor his memory and do the right thing. And he thinks he gets away with it until his pastor comes to him and says, King David, I got this problem. I got two guys. One's a wealthy man with a whole herd of sheep. The other one is a poor guy just has one lamb. It's not really livestock. It's really a pet that's inside the house with them. The rich man wanted to have dinner with some friends. And instead of killing one of his own, went to this poor guy, took his one lamb, killed it, and had it for dinner. I don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? And David is furious. He says, as long as I live, that man ought to die. And Nathaniel sticks his finger in David's face and says, you are that man. And from that confrontation, David writes Psalm 51. You know the psalm. You may not know it's from Psalm 51. Um, that I'm a sinner from my mother's womb. In sin did my mother conceive me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and create a new spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, but take not thy presence away from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. It's a penitential psalm in which David is fully confessing his sin before God.
And then after David dies, his son from Bathsheba, not the same one, that son dies, but another son from Bathsheba. His name is Solomon. His claim to fame is wisdom. So he's got a story in which they come before him and there's two women who are both claiming that this one child is their own. What should we do? And Solomon says, well, it's easy. We'll just divide the kid in half and give each one half to half a child. And, and one woman said, well, that sounds fair. And the other one says, no, give the child to her. And Solomon says, I know who the mom is. Wisdom. Because when Solomon took over, God gave him a signed blank check and asked Solomon, whatever you want, tell me what you want, and I'll give you it all. And Solomon thought about it, and he said, grant me wisdom to rule your people. And God was blown away. He said, because you didn't ask for riches, because you didn't ask for a lot of women, because you didn't ask for a long life, I'm going to give you all of that and wisdom. So Solomon does live a long time. Solomon was the wealthiest of all the kings who ever lived, even to today. The kingdom of Israel was the largest it ever was during his reign. And most of the Old Testament, prior to like Genesis through maybe Ruth. Anyways, that was written during Solomon's period. It was oral tradition before that. But when you're no longer fighting, when you're no longer starving to death, and you have time for literature, you finally have time to write down some things. So the Old Testament, a lot of it is from Solomon's time. It was written down. All right, so Solomon, Solomon's claim to fame, wisdom, his downside. Women, kind of. He had 800 concubines, which seems like a lot. <laughs> and, um, and one would come to him and say, Solomon, you, you wouldn't mind if we put this one statue from my former religion into the temple? That'd be fine. That'd be fine. Another one would come up and say, you don't mind if we um, added this part of the liturgy in which we confess that we believe in Marduk of Babylon? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, that too. And so little by little, all these different foreign religion idols were being brought into the temple under Solomon's reign. So when he finally dies, when he finally dies, his son comes up and they're asking him, what should you do? How should you rule? The older men, the older men tell his son, you got to back off on the taxes. You're killing the people. You got to back off on this conscription into the military service. You're drawing, you're separating the family. You got to ease up a little bit. He, said, mm -hmm. he talked to his young bucks. What should we do? He said, you got to tax them more. You got to put them in military action. You got to exert your power. Which way did he go? With the young bucks, which split the country. So now we have a divided kingdom. Kingdom, Israel was only a united country for three kings. And then the northern country is Israel. The southern one is Judah. And it's a mess. It's a mess. This is the time of the prophets. This is the time of the prophets. And the prophets are coming in and telling them how they're askew. So the first ones here, the rise of the Assyrian Empire, 721. 
Now, have you ever heard the parable of the Good Samaritan? The reason that the Good Samaritan is so offensive is because of Assyria. Assyria came to the northern part. They conquered it, destroyed the northern part, Israel. And part of Israel was a small territory called Samaria. And these Assyrians came in and they intermarried with the Jewish Samaritans. And so even to the point of Jesus' time, 700 years later, the Jewish people hated the Samaritans because they were muggles. They were not pure Jewish people. So when Jesus tells a story about the Samaritan is the one is the hero who stops, they're all thinking, oh, let it be a Roman soldier. Let it be some Egyptian, but not a Samaritan. That goes all the way back to that time. The good Samaritan. So then after Samaritan, we got the Babylonian Empire that comes in 587. Daniel in the lion's den. You remember Daniel in the lion's den? You know, taking out the thorn. I don't know. I think Aesop's fable, is it? <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're thrown into the fiery furnace. That's during this time. And then the rebuilding of the wall, because now Jerusalem is destroyed. Jerusalem is destroyed for 40 years. There is no Jewish state. Israel's gone. Judah is gone. And after 40 years, finally, they are able to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem by primarily two of the prophets named Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah. And then after this empire is done, the next one comes. You see, Israel was in the worst place geographically. In the north, you had empires like, like Assyria and Babylonia. And in the south, you had empires of Egypt. And whenever they wanted to do battle, they met in the middle, right there in Israel. And whenever they wanted to do trade, they came right through. Israel, even during its glory years of King Solomon, was nothing but a blip compared to the Egyptian, the Assyrian, and the Babylonian empires. It was never that big. Finally, the rise of the Greek empire. Who was this under? <laughs> Alec, not just Alexander. The great. the great, Alexander the Great, whose, whose tutor was who? Do anybody know? He was Plato. Yeah. That is right around 333 BC. He dies a very young man, but his influence is huge. He's not content to just take over a nation. He transforms it into a Greek or Hellenistic culture to the point now that towards the end of that Greek empire, Hebrew is a dead language. Only the priests are able to read and write Hebrew. Everything is turning into Greek, including the Old Testament. And in like 250 BC, they determined that they need to ch change the um, Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. And they had what's called the Septuagint. Septuagint. And the Septuagint is the word 70. Because the story goes that 70 scholars in 70 rooms for 70 days. And they translated it. Is that me? And they translated the Hebrew into the Greek. And then they compared all 70 translations from the last word to the first word, second to the last word to the second word, third to the last word to the third word. And they all came down to the same word in the middle, according to the story which means it was an authorized, God-given uh, translation into Greek because Hebrew is a dead language. 
333 to about 63 BC is when Rome comes. And Rome takes out Greece. And now, now we're getting into the biblical era, the New Testament era. There's this gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Anybody know what that gap is called? The Between Testaments. Clever. Intertestament period. And there's all these different writings. If anybody comes from a Catholic background, that Bible in the Catholic background has these collections, has a collection between the Old and New Testament. Anybody know the name of it? Is it right there? The, oh, is it in there? The Apocrypha. The Apocrypha. These are the, um, the, the collection of books. Didn't make the cut for the Old Testament, New Testament, the, but the Catholic Church still has it. Things like Tobias and Maccabees and a few others. Interesting what happens during this time. Because in the Old Testament, if a person is blessed by God, how is that blessing made manifest? Think about Solomon. How is a blessing? How do you know that a person is blessed by God? Lots of riches. You know, big family, lots of wives, lots of kids, long, long life, healthy life. That's how you know that you are a blessed person. However, during the intertestamental times, the very ones who are faithful are the ones who are being persecuted by the Greek and the Romans. The very ones that are faithful are the ones who are being robbed of all their riches because they can no longer work. The ones who are faithful are, are the ones who are dying young for their faith. And it didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. So in the wisdom of Solomon, that's one of the apocryphal books, the wisdom of Solomon, chapter, thir chapter 3, verse 16, it says the righteous only seem to die, and yet they shall live. This whole understanding of afterlife, the rewards of a faithful life being in heaven, happens during this time. There's not much talk about heaven in the Old Testament. There's hardly any talk there. That happens in the intertestament period in which they rethink what it means to be blessed by God. So by the time the New Testament comes, there is a full understanding of heaven and hell and the rewards and the punishments. Even, this, even the understanding of Satan is developed during this intertestamental period. In the Old Testament, Satan only appears outside the book of Job, only appears like one, like two or three times. And it's hardly anything. The book of Job talks about Satan, but, Job, but Satan in the book of Job can't do anything until God gives approval. So in the book of Job, Satan is really God's DA who prosecutes the ones that God wants to prosecute. But in the intertestamental period, it changes. And now there is a good versus evil. There is God versus Satan. And there are independent forces at work there trying to consume one another. And by the time we get to the New Testament then, it becomes much more full-blown in which Satan is an independent fallen angel. The whole idea about a fallen angel, that's from the intertestamental period as well. Now we're setting the scene for the New Testament because during this time, the intertestamental time, this Greek culture is, is oozing its way into Judaism. And there are those some people who can't stand it. And they say, we need to get back to the Bible, Old Testament, we need to get back to the Bible. And these people called themselves the pious ones or the separated ones. 
We're going to we're going to remain holy. And those that group of people were called the what? Pharisees. Pharisees. The separate ones, the Pharisees. They were the good guys. When it started, they were the good guys. This was a lay movement to be able to get back to the basic teachings of Judaism and restore the integrity and not be watered down by the Greco-Roman world. By the time Rome came, there got to be another segment too. These were the ones that ran off into the desert and became a monastery. Collectors of books. That group is called the Essenes. The Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S, -E -E Essenes. These were the ones who did the Dead Sea Scrolls. Do you know the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls? So about 70, 63, right around when Rome took over, these Essenes out in the wilderness, they collected a huge, huge library. What they were waiting for was the second coming, our understanding of the second coming. They were waiting for God to come down, destroy the area of all these foreigners, and then they were going to usher these Essenes back into Jerusalem. <laughs> so they collected all of these books, three kinds of books, Old Testament, um, communal rules, like how do you wash food? How do you wash your hands? I mean, how do you? And then the third group were interpretations of the Old Testament. Anyway, they collected all these things. They hid them in caves when they knew Rome was coming. And they remained in those caves from 70 BC till when? 1946. In 1946, a shepherd boy in Israel was looking for some sheep and he threw a rock into one of the many caves in the Qumran area and he heard a crash and he went in there and he found these ancient clay jars filled with perfectly preserved ancient documents. The discovery changed biblical interpretation. Because up to that point, up to that point, the oldest Old Testament that we had, the oldest Old Testament in Hebrew that we had was from the year 1000. Because they would, they would copy a new one, they would make a new copy and they would destroy the old. Take another one, destroy the old. The oldest one we had was 1000. So now we have these ancient Hebrew Old Testament documents that are at least a thousand years and probably older. And what's more, it is paleo Hebraic writing. It's not the modern stuff. When I say modern, Jesus time, late Jesus time. It was the oldest stuff. Why is that significant? If you're trying to figure out in Greek what a particular word means, you've got all of this Greek literature out there, Socrates, Plato, you got all this stuff. If you're trying to figure out in Hebrew what this word means, and it only appears once or twice, there's only the Old Testament. There's only the Old Testament to kind of do any cross-reference. So if Noah were to say that an ostrich walked onto the ark, you're really not sure if that's an ostrich or if that is a panda bear, because that word only comes up once. You have nothing really to compare to, except in 1946. Then they had the biblical text, they had the communal laws, and they had the interpretations. And biblical understanding of the Old Testament exploded. And what they found was this. Those people who copied manuscripts to the next manuscript, to the next man, they were like Xerox copying machines. They made very, very few mistakes. 
So if you ever hear anybody say, oh, all we have is copies of copies of copies of copies. These people were amazingly accurate. This was not a hobby for them. This is what they did. And they knew they were handling the word of God and everything was checked and double checked. Now we come to the point of Jesus. Oh, there was one more, two more actually. Because you have the, uh, the Pharisees were the lay movement and they were more progressive actually than the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the clergy and they were fundamentalists. In other words, if it wasn't in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. If it wasn't in there, they didn't believe it. And a good example is that one time the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and asked Jesus about the resurrection, about heaven. And the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That's why, that's why they were sad, you see. Owner. All right. Um, so the Sadducees and the Pharisees never really liked each other. That joke goes better when there's no masks on. I just, I know inside you're dying, but you just don't show it. Got it. <laughs> and then the fourth group are the zealots. And these were the terrorists. These were the ones who were trying to overthrow the Roman government through guerrilla warfare. So there were four sects of Judaism. That's gonna be important just a bit. During the Roman Empire, messianic activity, Jesus was not the only one who claimed to be the Messiah. There were other ones who claimed to be the Messiah and they met a gruesome death. Jesus was not the only one. And the rise of nationalism, going to be able to rebuild the kingdom. We have to get rid of these Romans. We have to reestablish our nation. So Jesus is born when? Trick question. You would think zero, right? <laughs> we know that Alexander the Great died in 4 BC. Alexander the Great was the one that the Magi went to and said, where is the one born of the Jews that we may worship him? And Alexander the Great, uh, Herod the Great, didn't know where. They ascertained that it was over in Bethlehem. And then what did he do after that? He killed every young boy under two years old. The assumption is Jesus was born anywhere between four to seven BC. Somebody in the Middle Ages made a mistake, didn't carry the one when they figured out the math of BC and AD. But we know that, that Jesus was born before Christ, just because of Herod the Great. The ministry lasts, his ministry really is how long? Three years. He lives to be that long. But his ministry, from the time of his baptism to the time of his death, maybe three years. And we don't know much. We know about his birth, right? We know that after his birth, he went to Egypt for a little bit. They ran away. Then nothing. And then there's a blip at age what? 12. He's found in the temple. And then there's nothing until he walks over that grassy knoll. And John the Baptist sees him and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What is that? 20 years? 18 years? Of silence? And that's the big speculation. What was Jesus doing during this time? Some suggest that he was out in the um, Qumran area with the Essenes because some suggest that he was actually a disciple of John the Baptist. 
because there was some rivalry between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples until John said, go that way. Option one. Option two, he was just making cabinetry work up there in Nazareth with his dad until he died. There is a strange story about a person who appears about this time in India and does miracles and learns from the wise men over there. You can find some research, you can find some books that Jesus really learned his trade in India during those silent years. That's doubtful. It could happen, it's doubtful. So then, <clears throat> Jesus dies, we know this one because he dies under Pontius Pilate, and we know how long Pontius Pilate was there. It's right around 33 is that when Jesus dies. So he's probably closer to 40 than most people have always said. He's like 33 when he dies. Maybe closer to 40. Jesus dies like 33. Paul writes, he starts writing in, a, in the 50s. In the 50s. Now, right, Paul writes two-thirds of the New Testament. And his writings are called the epistles which is a Greek word that means what? Letters, letters. Paul begins writing in the 50s until his death is his, that should be an H, his death in 64. Paul dies in 64. And how is Paul put to death? Beheaded. The reason that he's beheaded and not crucified is because he was a Roman citizen. And the way that he became a Roman citizen is that either he bought his Roman citizenship or his family bought his Roman citizenship. And so when they arrested him, you know, he pulled out the uh, Roman card and says, is this the way that you treat a Roman citizen? <laughs> and then they have to give him a whole trial and they behead him instead of because you don't crucify Roman citizens. So he writes during those 14 years, goes on three missionary trips. Let's go a little bit more because I got one more thing to talk about. All right, so then Paul writes first, and then you have the synoptics. The synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Sin means together, optics, what you see. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke can be seen side by side. And here's the theory. You've got Mark that was written between 60 and 70. You've got Matthew around 80, Luke around 80, and then you have Q. And the reason it's called Q is short for Quella. And the reason it's called Quella is because some German theologian figured this thing out. And Quella just means source. So here's the theory. Everything that's in, everything that's in Mark's gospel, everything that's in Mark's gospel can also be found in Matthew and Luke. But then Matthew has his own unique stuff. And Luke has his own unique stuff. Like the parable of the Good Samaritan is only in Luke. Matthew, Luke, and then you have Q. There's some stuff that's in Matthew and Luke, but they're not in Mark. The idea is from Q. So when Matthew is writing out his gospel, he's got a copy of Q. He's got a copy of Mark. And he's got his own material that he puts together his gospel. Same thing with Luke. Luke has Q, Luke has Mark in his own material. No one has ever found Q before. That's a good theory. The idea is this. If you were going to write a gospel, would you truncate it or would you add to it? Would you truncate an existing one or would you add to an existing one? The theory is, of course, you would add to that. That is, this is what Mark has. 
And I will add the additional information that I've come, come to know. Rather than the other way around, that, that Mark took Matthew and, and truncated Matthew down into Luke's form. The reality is that each one of them is a different author writ, writing to a different audience for a different purpose. And so they have a different style of writing and a different purpose in writing. Now, we've always thought that Matthew was the first one written because it's the first one in line, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it's probably Mark. Now, John is the oldest one. That's right around 90. That's right around 90. The earliest manuscript, and that means nothing more than just maybe a page, is from 130 from John chapter 8. The earliest complete Bible is 325. There's two of them, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Earliest canon is 189. Canon is a word that means measuring rod. And when we talk about the canon, we say, what are the official books in the Old Testament canon? What are the official books in the New Testament canon? Has anybody ever watched The Da Vinci Code? It's a great movie. It's a good murder mystery for the airport. It is awful when it comes to biblical uh, knowledge and understanding. I think in there they said something like, there are like 80 different gospels out there and they only chose four. I've never, I've never heard of 80. There might be a dozen, it's not 80. And then in the Da Vinci Code it says, and then they were chosen in 325 at 325 at the Council of Nicaea. They were chosen because this elevated the divinity of Jesus, which is wrong. Because if you were going to choose gospels that elevated the divinity of Jesus, you wouldn't have chosen Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, maybe John. Because the other ones had stories of Jesus as a young boy in Egypt, that his dad in the carpentry shop cut a, cut a log too short. And so Jesus, his son, comes and just stretches the log a little bit and makes it fit. He's got other stories of little Jesus in Egypt playing in the mud and making little balls, throwing them in the air and becoming birds. There's other stories in there in which this Jesus as a boy, he, he gets mad at one of his playmates, strikes them dead, just strikes them dead with his word, and then brings them back to life again. But if you really wanted to find gospels that elevated the divinity of Jesus, you wouldn't have chosen these. Second of all, these four were chosen because they're the oldest ones written. The other ones I just mentioned, they're anywhere from 150 to 250 AD, written then. And not even in Greek. Some are in Coptic language down in northern, northern Egypt. These four are chosen because these four were the best ones. And the canon in 189, in 189, the early church already determined what the canon was going to be. And the Council of Nicaea in 325 just ratified it. They said, yes, this, these are the ones. So it didn't change. So don't let the Da Vinci Code tell you that they were messing around with the canon for all these years and then stacked the deck when it came to putting it together. It was in place from the very early beginning. Now, there were three criteria used to determine whether a book would make it in the Bible or not. Three criteria. Number one, connection to an apostle. It couldn't be Bob's gospel. <laughs> it's gotta be a connection to an apostle. Number two, it had to be theologically consistent. You couldn't have one that said he rose from the dead. Another one said he didn't rise from the dead. Theologically consistent. And the third one 
is perhaps the best one of all. It had to be widely used. And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of, a lot of early church writings that circulated around with Paul and the early churches. There's a lot that, that didn't make the cut. And the reason they didn't make the cut is because they weren't edifying to the churches. They would read them, look at them, say, this doesn't make sense, or this isn't helpful. And over time, through natural selection, these are the ones that were edifying the church and building up the body of Christ. There are some other ones that I read, particularly during my seminary years, that are just they're not on par with what we have in the New Testament. They're poorly written, they're disorganized, they don't flow, and they're not consistent. The canon that we have in place here is a canon that has stood the test of time. But how do we know it's true? How do we know it's true? Let me, one more thing historically. There was probably only in all of human history a window of about 75 years in which the Christ could have been born. I say it again. In all of human history, there was probably only 75 years, maybe even 50 years in which the Christ could have been born. Remember what Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That is, God is bringing together all of the details in ways that we will never acknowledge, never even visibly see, to bring all things to completion according to his will. In 63, when Rome came in, they called it the Pax Roma, the peace of Rome. This was a time in which there was most widespread peace that had ever happened during this area, even to today. Not only was there peace, but literally all roads led to Rome. That is, there was easy transportation around the whole Roman Empire. And there was a unanimity of language. Certainly there were different dialects, but people spoke Greek or Latin. So there was an area in which Paul, in which Paul could move freely throughout the whole Roman Empire in language, in protection, in the roads, number one. But Paul went on these three missionary journeys. Remember when he started, like in the early 50s? And by the time of mid-60s, ever hear of Nero and the fires of Rome and him fiddling and all this kind of stuff? The fires of Rome were blamed on Christians. Evidently, there was a large enough group to use them as a scapegoat. You got to ask the question, from the time of Jesus' death in 33 to the time of Nero and the fires in mid-60s, 30 years, how does Christianity go from Jerusalem up through Turkey, jump over to Greece, over to Europe mainland, all the way up to Rome, and be a significant significant religion in 30 years. Pax Roma, yes. But God has laid the kindling all the way. Remember the Babylonian captivity, 587 BC. After they were released from captivity, they go anywhere. The new king said, you can go anywhere. Some stayed in Babylonia because it was green. It was nice. 
They had got a business there. They've been there 40 years. Some went down to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, Ezra and Nehemiah. But do you know where most went? They scattered throughout all of Asia Minor, up Turkey, into Greece, into Italy. So that when Paul went on his missionary journeys, where did he always go first? He went to the synagogues. Always, always went to the synagogue. Now, he was usually kicked out of the synagogue, went to the Gentiles, but he always went to the synagogue. You have to ask a question. Where did all these synagogues come from? It came from the Babylonian diaspora, in which God was laying the kindling from Jerusalem to Samaria, up through Turkey, up through Greece, and to Rome, laying the kindling so that when the light of the gospel was lit by Paul in the missionary journeys, and the pox of Rome enabled free transportation, safe transportation, and unanimity of language. In 30 years, in 30 years, it spread to be a significant group in Rome that far away. But the last thing, the last thing is even more significant. How many sects of Judaism are there right now? At this time in the biblical history? There's four, right? Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and the Zealots. In the, in the Roman Empire, in the Roman Empire, anything but emperor worship was forbidden. Anything but emperor worship was forbidden, except Judaism. Because Rome could not squash Judaism. They were way too zealot. They were way too stiff-necked. They would not give up their faith. So Rome gave one exception. We're going to let Judaism survive. And how many sects are there? Four. Here comes Christianity. And for 40 years, it was never seen as a separate religion. Not to extent. It was seen as a messianic Judaism. In other words, Christianity hid in the womb of Judaism for about 30 or 40 years. Until it got to the point in which the Jews kicked the Christians out of the synagogue. Because they were worshiping on Sundays, not Saturdays. And Rome didn't even really notice to that great extent that Christianity was growing because they saw it as just a sect of Judaism. Until 70 AD, and Rome came down with a vengeance, destroyed all the terrorist zealots, destroyed all the clergy, went out to the Qumran and killed all of them, and there was only one sect left over, and it was Pharisees. And the Pharisees looked and said, those Messianic Jews are not us. But by the time Rome discovered it, by the time Judaism recognized it, that fire had been lit and had gone all the way up to Rome. And after 70 AD, that window of opportunity closed because now there was only one Judaism branch. It's really about 50 years is only a small window. And here is God laying the foundations since 587 BC to make sure at the fullness of time, according to the book of Galatians, the fullness of time, the Messiah comes. Five more minutes. Got one more thing to show you. How do we know that it's true? I had a sermon here just a little bit ago. Uh, stop sharing. I had a sermon here a little bit ago on um, how do we know the Bible is true? Anybody hear that one? Nobody. You know, I work hard on this stuff. <laughs> Nothing. Where are you? Here it is. Let me share screen. All right. How do we know? How do we know the Bible is the most accurately transmitted document in all of antiquity? 
Herodotus. This is all about um, um, Greek history. Written about this time, 450 BC. The earliest copy we have is 900. It is 13 year gap between when it was written and the earliest copy. And there are eight copies, but nobody sits around and debates whether or not Greek history is true. Tacitus, early part of the Roman history, first century, earliest copy, a thousand years later, there are 20. Nobody sits around and debates whether or not Rome ever existed. Levy's Roman history, even before that, 900, there's 900 years different, 20 copies. Nobody is suggesting that Caesar Augustus never lived or was a fairy tale. But when it comes to the New Testament, it was written between Paul and the book of John. Earliest manuscript is 130. Full Bible is from 350. There's either a 40 year gap on the manuscripts or 300 for the full. There's 25,000 manuscripts. And the difference between them is almost neg is negligible. The Bible is the most accurately transmitted book in all of antiquity. But then you have to ask the question, but is it true? I mean, you can accurately transmit Aesop's fables, right? You can accurately transmit some fairy tale, but is it true? And here is where you have to kind of ask some really important questions. If you were going to make up this stuff, if you were going to make up this stuff, you wouldn't do it this way. What do I mean by that? You wouldn't have the disciples looking like the bumbling idiots that they are, that have no idea in whose presence they are after three years. Even when he's resurrected, it says, and some doubted. I'm just not sure, Jesus. If you just show us a sign or something, even when he comes back, they say, will you at this time now restore the kingdom to Israel? That is, will you now get rid of Rome? They still didn't. If you were going to make this up, you wouldn't make them bubbling, bambling idiots because these are the leaders of the early church. If you're going to make this stuff up, you would have many more fanciful stories of Jesus. Like, throwing the mud and birds, like stretching dad's lumber, like you'd make that up that way, but not the ones that are the most accurate. If you're gonna make this stuff up, you wouldn't have women as the primary witnesses to the resurrection because their testimony was not legitimate in the courts at that time. If you're gonna make this stuff up, you would make sure that these stories would line up. Who was at the tomb? We don't know. There's four different stories and all four of them are somewhat different. If you're gonna make it up, you'd make sure that you've got your story together. The fact that there are some discrepancies, the fact that it is absurd makes it more believable. Do you guys ever have Jehovah's Witnesses come by your house and they're knocking at your door maybe? All right, so I might have a different view of this because when I see them coming, you can see them a while. So I get a rake out of my garage and I go to the front yard by the curb. I just kind of rake in something around until they stop by me and come talk to me. <laughs> and they come and talk to me. And I say, I, you know, I would like to know, first of all, were you born Jehovah's Witness or, um, or were you converted? Or did you marry into it? Because if you were married into it, I kind of understand following your spouse. If you were born into it, I kind of understand this is all that you knew. But if you actually read this stuff and you deliberately chose this, then we need to talk. And so then I use the Gospel of John, which we'll get into next week, and to show how the Gospel of John clearly identifies Jesus as the son of God, and not just the son of God, God in the flesh. 
because the Jehovah's Witness do not believe that Jesus is the same with God. They just believe God is one and Jesus is his son, is not in, in par with, with God. And so I'm going through it one after another after another until they finally say, we can't stay here all day. We need to move on to the next house. I say, come back any time. I'd like to have this conversation. Because the Bible, the reason that Jesus was put to death is not because he fed 5,000 people and not because he healed individuals and not because he told us to love one another. The reason that he was put to death, the reason the Pharisees wanted to put him to death is because he made himself equal to God. That's what they heard. And if Jesus weren't who he claimed to be, they rightfully put him to death because blasphemy was punishable by death if he weren't who he claimed to be. But they obviously heard that. They obviously heard Jesus because you don't put a good guy like that to death for telling people to love one another. So the teachings are telling us that he made him see equal to God. And then the fourth or the fifth reason really quickly, the disciples. Of course, got the 12 original disciples. Judas hangs himself. John lives to be a ripe old age. Why is that? Jesus is on the cross and he says to him, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. He gives his mom over to John to take care of him. So he lives to a ripe old age. He writes the book of Revelation. The other 10 die gruesome, gruesome deaths. James is killed with the sword, the first one. Peter is crucified upside down. St. Andrew has the, the cross, the X cross that he's crucified on. Bartholomew is skinned alive. Thomas has a javelin put through him. I mean, each one. And you got to ask yourself the question, if you knew it was a lie, if you were one of the original ones, and yet you're going throughout the whole world telling people about Jesus, how far up your leg do they have to start skinning your foot until you say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll show you where the body is. We made the whole thing up. How, how much do they have to burn you alive until you give in? But not one of them not one of them gave up. Nobody would die for a lie. It is the most accurately transmitted book in all of antiquity. But more importantly than that, it is the most truthful book in all of antiquity. And next week, we're going to jump into it. All right, ready? Bring your books. We didn't get into that, but you got your test all filled out. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us here online.